So tonight our first speaker is Geraint Luff. He's a DSP engineer, musician, and mathematician from SignalSmith Audio. And tonight he's gonna to be talking to us about designing a straightforward limiter. Take it away. Hi. Yeah, so I'll just, uh, I'll just share my screen. I can get that to work. Excellent. Right, uh, so today we're going to be, well, I'm going to go through um, designing a limiter. And by designing, I mean, uh, it's a, a bit of a, a thought process, sort of um, full disclosure. This is not something I researched a lot before I wrote one. Um, so I needed to write a limiter and had a sort of, uh, first you make the requirements, then you figure out how to solve the requirements. And so we're just gonna walk through that process. Um, I have no inner knowledge of how commercial, any specific commercial limiter is made, um, but this is a hopefully nice, simple design, which people can uh, get going with if you're curious about. Um, so here's the challenge. Uh, we have some kind of signal uh, and uh, the waveform goes outside the range that we want. Uh, so here is our sound. So you can hear that there we've got a, um, a mixture of some smooth textures and then some transient drums kicking in. So this is a sort of classic uh, problem for a limiter because you want to keep the drums uh, tamed, bring them in, bring the peaks down, uh, but without uh, ruining too much the overall sound. Um, so yeah, how, how do we do this? The uh, obvious thing to do is uh, we want to change the gain over time. So if this is our waveform, um, then while the waveform is inside the allowed limits that we have decided we want, um, we can just pass it straight through with gain one, zero dB. Um, and then when it pokes outside these regions, uh, we scale it down just enough so that uh, it gets brought back inside the limits. Uh, so uh, here's some C++ code to do that. Um, yeah, we calculate a gain value, which is, you know, is it outside the limit? And then if so, we bring it back in, otherwise we return one. And uh, if you really want to be nice and concise, here's a, a sweet little um, short, <laughs> One liner for that. Um, and yeah, this is what the gain graph looks like. So uh, you can see that where there were sort of these peaks in the info audio, the gain has dipped down. So let's have a listen to that. You see, what we've done here is we've accidentally created a hard clipper because whenever the signal goes outside the allowed range, we just bring it exactly back to the limit. And so these fast changing gains that we saw here end up modulating the signal <laughs> really fast as it sort of, you know, pops up and down outside the limits um, and it sounds a bit awful. So uh, what we really want to do is, uh, this is the maximum gain that we're allowed to uh, apply to our signal. So we want a nice smooth gain signal that stays safely below this calculation that we started with. So these are the requirements that we've, we've now laid out. Uh, we want a smooth curve and we've got our sort of very awful clipper uh, style gain and the curve has to stay below those gain values that we just, uh, just calculated. So um, there is a neat way to solve this problem. It comes in two steps. Um, the first is uh, a moving minimum. So the red dotted line here is the, uh, the minimum gain in the last however long you choose, 20 milliseconds or so. Um, so you can see already that this is a nice, like it's not as spiky. Um, and then uh, we're not gonna listen to that. <laughs> But the next step we're going to do is we're going to get rid of the spikiness. Uh, oh, no, we're not. We're going to look at some example code, sorry. Um, yeah, so let's assume you have some kind of moving maximum. Um, I'll talk a bit later about how you might 
try and do that. Um, but yeah, you know how long you you want your like your holding period to be, and when you get a sample in, you calculate a gain, um, which is uh, this calculation we had before, and then to turn a moving maximum into a moving minimum, you invert the input, and then you invert the output. So this gives you the, uh, the graph that you have here. And the next stage is we're going to smooth out this, uh, this moving minimum. So you've got these sharp jumps here at the beginning and the end. Um, if you take a finite length, any kind of average, weighted average across this period, then hopefully you can see that if the average occurs is limited to these, this range here, then the weighted average will be also below that peak. So we can see this in this graph here, we've added the uh, green dotted, so a green dashed line for the, um, for the smoothed version of our moving minimum. And so this is the way that we've chosen to solve this today. Um, but the general principle of you start with the most obvious thing, which is, okay, just apply again to bring it back into range. And then you sort of deal with that problem and you're like, okay, well, let's try smoothing it, but smoothing it's not enough. You try the, whatever tools you have to hand. Um, and let's look at the, uh, the code for what we've just written. No, let's look at the, the flow for what we've written here. Um, wait, hang on, where's this? Ah, <laughs> so sorry. Um, as you can see, the, uh, the green dashed line is slightly behind the blue peaks. So um, we have a nice smooth gain curve and it's just whatever it is, 20 milliseconds or so behind the peak you want to get. So we, what we have is we have a two, uh, two paths in our flow and we do our maximum gain calculation. That's our um, awful clipper. Uh, we do our minimum moving minimum and then we do our smoothing. And this gives us, this is our dashed green output here. And uh, then we correspondingly, ooh, interesting. Um, we correspondingly delay the, uh, the actual audio signal to bring the peaks in line with the reduced gain. Um, here is how you might do that in code. Um, so these are just setting up the ingredients. You, say what your limit is, you say how long your attack should be. Um, and then we use our peak hold and then any kind of smoother here. I'll talk a bit later about like what types of smoother that can be. Um, the simplest would just be a box filter, right? So um, a moving average that just takes the average of your last 20 milliseconds. Um, but any, any finite smoother, finite filter will work here. And then our delay to delay the input signal. Um, we configure with the sample rate and we convert our millisecond specifications into samples. And we pass that to the smoother and the moving minimum and the delay. And then we have our gain calculation. We have our awful clipping gain. Um, we have our moving minimum, and then we pass it through whatever smoothing filter we have to hand. Um, I'm using some examples from my DSP library here, but like hopefully there should be similar utilities around um, in other frameworks. Um, and yeah, so here we should report our latency, which is whatever our length was, 20 milliseconds or so. Um, and yeah, we take our input sample, apply the gain to um, get the gain, and then we read a delayed signal and apply that gain. Uh, yeah, so here is what sort of that output looks like. Um, and let's have a listen.
but that's a lot better than uh, our first attempt. Um, we've um, we've had a smoother gain uh, envelope, and uh, but we stayed strictly below this clipping uh, curve, which means that our output is also stay, stays within the bounds. Um, this is actually a complete functional limiter. This this works. I'll play that again. Um, so this only has one dial at the moment. Well, it's got the threshold and the smoothing time. And if you look at the um, the curve that this the gain takes when you have a peak, if you it, this is a diagram of what happens if you have a big peak at some time zero, uh, the maximum gain. Our clip again is this red dashed one, and it will have a massive dip in it um, because for that sample, we need to reduce the gain a lot. Um, we did a, uh, a peak hold, which isn't on this diagram, but you can imagine that sort of just extends this line out into a sort of square. And then we've done our whatever smoothing we've used. Um, but it's symmetrical and it might be that we want our attack to be short and then to take slightly longer to come back in. So this can be done really easily. Uh, that's, uh, this is our flow and it's exactly the same as before, except we've just added a release element here. Now the simplest one uh, to add is an exponential release. So this is the, um, our, oh, yeah, um, our minim minimum hold, moving minimum signal is the uh, the blue one here. And then our release curve that we're creating is going to be this exponential one. So when it decreases, it decreases instantly. When it increases, it increases slowly. And oh, I'll zoom out so you can see the code. Um, yeah. So you calculate some kind of... Uh, averaging value for your um, exponential. And then uh, every time you have an input sample, you move towards it slowly. But if it turns out that you're decreasing, then you move down instantly. So this is how you can produce this kind of uh, release curve. And it's hopefully reasonably straightforward. Um, so this, is, this would just be like a first order sort of one pole smoothing filter, except we've added this uh, instant uh, move downwards. And in, in the flow here, we've put it, we've put the release before the smoothing, we've put it between the two elements. Um, you can have a play around, like if you put it here, then it sort of takes any sharp corners off the, the envelope, so the envelope is always smooth. But uh, yeah, try a few different things, like this isn't coming from a place of uh, very detailed wisdom, this is just something that works. Um, the other thing you might want is hold times. That's pretty common. Um, if you've got a lot of peaks in quick succession, uh, you might want to still have a fast attack, but to not actually start your release for a bit. This is, again, really easy to add to our flow um, because you just increase your moving minimum by a bit more. So previously, our moving minimum was exactly the same as the smoothing length. And now you just hold on a bit longer. And if you look at, this is the gain response uh, with both of those things added. So this is our um, dip in the maximum gain because of the, uh, the loud signal we've had at time zero. The attack length here um, has uh, smoothed the attack. Then we can see that it holds on for a bit longer. And then we have our release uh, curve, which was exponential. But as I said, we put it before the smoothing, which means the start of this release curve is also nice and smooth. Um, yeah, so. I don't know if you can actually hear the difference between that and the previous one over Zoom, um, but we've definitely got more controls and Audio people love dials, right? Add more of them. Um, yeah, uh, so that's a sort of, this, this works. Um, and let's look at the, the example code uh, that you might 
used to write this. Um, so we've got our four parameters here, the threshold, attack, hold, and release. We've got the same things that we had before um, with our sort of single time control, except we've now also got this uh, exponential release, which is exactly the class that we saw before. Um, zoom out, zoom out. Um, yeah, after a while, this code stops becoming pretty, but basically we are still converting milliseconds to samples just repeatedly. Uh, we're setting up our exponential releases. Um, we're setting our peak hold to be not just attack samples, but attack and hold. So um, our moving minimum um, will extend beyond uh, what we originally needed. And then this is, again, exactly the same, except between our moving minimum and our smoother, we've got our release envelope. Um, and then, yeah, exactly the same as before. We've got an input sample, calculate the gain, read a delayed audio sample to compensate for the latency um, of the, the, the smoothing. And then we go and apply it. So I've just made a bunch of off-the-cuff choices about how we um, implement which release curves we use, how you do attacks. Like, I haven't explained any of the, the details of what makes a, a different one different. Um, and I'm not going to. Um, <laughs> this is some, this kind of, uh, when you have all these different options that you could, you could take, uh, some of it, is um, a question of judgment and opinion. Um, personally, I like to find a good metric, some, some numerical thing you can measure, and then you can test your implementation against that and then optimize it and find some best solution. Um, but what you choose for that is also up to you. Uh, but yeah, you start with, anything and then you can start getting uh, make, making more subtle choices but i'm just going to sketch out a couple of things that you might want to do so if there's alternate ways you could release instead of uh, exponential you could just increase the gain at a fixed ratio um there's a quite a, a funky one where the uh the gain increases back to one at a fixed rate so it the release always takes the same amount of time um this is quite fun. If you cascade multiple exponential release curves, this is our blue one where, you know, we've had some instant production and then later uh, it's decaying back up to one. Um, if you cascade them together, then you get softer and softer starts to your release curves. Um, this is, you can also cascade that sort of fixed length one. Um, I, I'm not going to go into the detail of how the fixed length one works here, but um, another thing you probably want to consider for a limiter is uh, intersample peaks. So we have so far just concerned ourselves, concerned ourselves with making sure that each individual sample is within the output range that we want. Um, but when those signals go to the to the DAC or uh, they get encoded into a WAV file, maybe there are errors or there's sample rate conversion or something, um, then uh, you can end up with these peaks that pop outside the range, even though the individual input samples are within it. Um, again, this isn't actually too difficult to, uh, to incorporate once you know what that value is. So the thing you basically would want to do to tackle this is instead of for each sample calculating just the gain for that sample, you might want to oversample or upsample or in some other ways interpolate to get some of these intermediate values and then just take the minimum gain and then assign it to that sample. And then all the rest of the smoothing and everything else is, it can, it can be the same. Um, yeah, there's a few different things to try. We um, we worked at the moment with everything being just dealing with amplitude, uh, but quite often the attacks and releases of you know, compressors and stuff will work in decibel space. So uh, 
we could do that here. Like all you have to do to do that is you take your maximum gain from your sort of clipping gain, and then you convert it to dB, and then you do all the same things that you did before. And then before you actually apply it to your signal, you convert back from dB. So that's just another thing that you could do. Um, I talked about how you might calculate a moving minimum. Um, that's a whole other thing. Um, if you have an off-the-shelf one, use it. Uh, but if you're rolling your own and you don't fancy uh, reading my blog post about it, uh, then another thing you can do is you can just, uh, to save a bit of CPU, because recalculating the whole minimum every sample would be horrendously slow, um, but you can kind of chop it up into smaller regions and you can keep updating this like smaller one at the front that keeps growing. Um, but these other chunks that you've previously calculated, you already know the minimum for that and you just store it. And then at the end, you can just do whatever it is, 10 moving min uh, 10 minimums for the comparison. Um, it's not the most efficient. And you also get the problem that like, you can't drop this off gradually. So maybe sometimes your minimum is slightly longer than you need. Um, but again, it works and it's fine. And you can uh, place limits on exactly how bad it is by uh, how finely you chop it up. Um, the finite smoothing. So we've had our, um, done our peak or our moving minimum. Um, and then we had to have our smoothing and it had to be finite because we knew that our um, moving minimum was going to be less than, our gain was going to be less than the, the, what we needed, but only for a fixed amount of time. So we needed to have a smoothing function, which was zero outside that, um, so that all the averaging that we took uh, was from within that region where we knew it was less than. Um, I said we needed to, but like, what happens if you don't? Um, if you don't want to do like a, uh, an FIR filter, you can cascade a few other filters. You can cascade a bunch of one poles um, and it will be almost zero by the end of the, uh, the, uh, the period you need. And that means you'll be almost correct <laughs> and you'll be just over the limit occasionally. Um, and you can, you can actually clip your output at that point. Um, um, yeah, Dario uh, on, on the audio programmer uh, Discord and I have had some fantastic discussions about this. Um, and yeah, I, I, I've got a link to his paper from the, the blog post because uh, yeah, uh, he presents it at the Faust conference because he, he is interesting. We both um, started from the same uh, first principles uh, situation and ends up with different enough solutions that we uh, had some great, great chats about it. Um, yeah, and there's a bunch of other things you could consider uh, adaptive release or splitting it into bands is always kind of appealing because that's what you do for compressors and stuff. And that's slightly more transparent, but um, it gets sticky because if, uh, if you split it into bands and then some of the bands like actually go opposite directions after you've done a band split, then change the gain of one, it could make it worse. Um, my point is there's, there's a whole, this is a basic design. There's a lot of places you can take it. Um, but what we've made actually works. Uh, so we start with our uh, uh, hard clipping kind of gain. Uh, we've changed, we specified our attack time as the smoothing period, pulse time, which is how much extra peak hold, and then our release time. I mean, this is a very, very simple design. Um, and yeah, it sounds pretty good. Um, actually, I'm going to uh, load up Reaper now and I can show you some things, uh, show you it working on a live track. So hopefully you can see and hear this. So what we have here is the, the green uh, spiky signal is this clipping gain uh, that we calculated in our um, in our flow. And then we've got this uh, 
This is actually just using a box filter. So a rectangular moving average, which can be done very cheaply um, of after, after that peak hold. So for the, you know, this peak, I'll have a peak hold, and then there'll be a, a moving average after that, which means that um, the average for that period is always going to be below the, the peak you need. And then we sort of shift, the, uh, shift it back in time uh, with latency. Uh, yeah, if you want, instead of using single box filter, you could use uh, two, if I can make this slide work. And you can see that this is sort of, when you have a, a single peak, you get these kind of straight line looking segments. Um, whereas, you can see that the, uh, the eventual gain curve we produce is actually nice and smooth. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. That's the that's that's the talk. Um, yeah, are there any questions? Thanks so much, Jarrett. That, that was really awesome. Um, I'm going to give the, uh, the live chat a couple minutes to uh, come up with some more questions. I had a couple questions. Um, yeah. One question I had was going back to the part where you said re. Uh, maybe I heard this wrong, but you said that sometimes reconstructing a continuous signal from a discrete signal, you can get, even though the values in the discrete signal are below the limit, below the, um, below the limiter, below the threshold, that they can still produce values that are above, uh, the, that are above the, the allowed range. Yeah. So can you explain that a little bit further? Yeah, um, so when we have a, an audio signal, it is uh, sampled. So we know its value at a particular moment in time and then a bit later. Um, but in order to send it down the wires to speakers or um, various other things, uh, we have to add more values in between. And this uh, upsampling generally, uh, you. <laughs> You can kind of think of it as uh, being like a low pass. Uh, and so when you create a smooth curve from these points, um, like it'll, uh, how do I explain this? This bit up here is going to be some amount of this and some amount of this, but it's also going to subtract some of the other ones so it's not just um, the, the kind of uh, positive only smoothing uh, low pass stuff that we had for uh, filtering the gain envelope. Uh, this is the ideal form as a sync filter, but whatever filter you use, it's gonna have ripples in the impulse response. And so you could end up with a situation where you add a positive one and then subtract a negative one um, so that it ends up catapulting the output slightly, slightly outside. I don't know. Anything up? Got it. Um, another question that I wanted to ask was: you you had talked a little bit about what makes what gives a limiter character. Uh, so, would you say that it's mainly to the way that the filters are constructed to give it its appropriate attack and release times, or would you say that there are more that it could be more? potentially more complicated than that. What, what is it that gives a limiter uh, when people say that it's, let's say an analog, analog, analog style limiter, what would that, what would that entail? Yeah, so um, what we've created here is a very, it's a look ahead limiter, meaning it uh, uses latency. Um, and it's a brick wall limiter, meaning that it exactly limits the output. Um, but our goal mostly was to be linear. So we, we didn't want that kind of fast changing gain that originally caused our very clipping sound. Um, but actually uh, analog limiters or various other things like, because you're taking down the peaks, you can sometimes lose the edge. So um, this is kind of a very vanilla approach and a lot of uh, uh, like a, a good limiter that you might uh, sort of pay a lot for, or you want it in hardware or, that kind of thing. Um, there'll be some extra magic again, as as I sort of said about um, start the thing and you find a problem. Like you get this far and then you go, 
hang on, my bass drum doesn't feel like, <laughs> like it used to. So yeah. if you, you know, maybe undershoot your limiting, as I talked about with that, you know, um, the not quite finite limiting, uh, then, you know, may maybe this, uh, this curve here wouldn't quite reach uh, the peak that it needed to. And so you, for that tiny instant, get a bit of clipping. And that kind of, uh, that kind of thing is, is quite common in uh, more analog setups because you don't have this sort of perfect digital look ahead and it adds character. It brings back some of the, um, the sharp impacts that you lost by reducing the gain. That's not the only way you can try and do that. You could just, you could do some transient processing explicitly to try and get that kind of thing. But um, uh, the character is sort of, um, yeah, lots of, lots of small choices, the exact curves, the exact release curves, and then obviously anything excitingly nonlinear on top of that. Got it. Um, and then the slides and the code you have on your website, right? Would you, would you like to shout that out? And I'll also put it in the video description as well. Yeah, so let's see. I should have loaded this up. That would be very smart. Um, I did not. Yeah, but it's, it's currently my sort of latest one. No, that's not the right one. Yeah, there we are. So this is uh, the exact same presentation, but in, in blog post form. It's not exactly the same, but um, yeah. And you've got the example code here. Um, and I'll also put this up in GitHub in case that's useful for anyone. Awesome. Uh, so it's signalsmith-audio.co.uk. I'll put that in the chat as well for people. And I will put that in the video uh, the video description later on. Uh, we have <clears throat> um, two more questions. One question, uh, wouldn't it be better to use a ballistics filter or an envelope follower using um, abs, absolute value or windowed sc uh, square root mean? Um, that is kind of what you did though, but you did it more from scratch. Am I right in saying that? So the ballistics filter is, uh, if I am understanding what that's referencing, I think that's infinite impulse response. I don't think that's finite, um, unless that's the one. Maybe that looks more like uh, this kind of uh, one of these two. Um, yeah, like, why not? I think the, the question with the, uh, the RMS is, I need to find a way to turn off the audio examples. Um, yeah, so in this uh, architecture, the absolute value is here. Um, and then our smoothing is, is done here. Like RMS is more something you'd use for a compressor. So you could make a compressor on a very similar design where instead of uh, this um, absolute value and then uh, moving minimum, you would do a uh, uh, squared or absolute value and then filter that and that's your energy metric and then you again calculate your instantaneous gain that you want and smooth out your gain changes and add a release curve um yeah i don't think you tend to get rmss and limiters that's more of a compressor kind of thing got it but the only difference between a compressor and a limiter is just the uh, ratio right like isn't isn't a limiter just a compressor with a infinite um, ratio? Or, um... A compressor works on a, a short-term energy metric, which is more like the kind of perceptual loudness. Um, there's no guarantee that like that perceptual loudness implies a limited waveform. So uh, a limiter, you'll you have like a very strict requirement of what samples you want, whereas a compressor, your requirement is more about how loud it sounds. And so uh, your, your gain calculation is based on something slightly different. Here we're using kind of instantaneous sample by sample gains. And then for a compressor, you might want, um, uh, yeah, your short term, like five milliseconds or 10 or whatever it is of, um, of audio, and then calculate a gain according to that. But if you just crank a compressor up with a hundred to one ratio, it won't inherently produce a limiter. Got it. Okay, great. Um, 
there's another question from Jess asking, how do you, is there a way that you could simply turn this into an expander? So expanders are uh, more similar to compressors, uh, but the basic principle of you get some metric, whether it's your, uh, your sort of moving minimum peak or a short time uh, RMS, and then you map that gain. So it's, you just do exactly the same things as you would for a compressor, but instead of, uh, you know, if it's above this, this threshold, then scale the dB down. You have a, if it's below this threshold, scale, scale down. Um, I think I would use a more compressor style metric like RMS rather than basing it on waveform peaks uh, for an expander. Got it. But yeah, a lot of these dynamic processes are, you can come to them with the same kind of attitude. Awesome. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Jarrett. That was really awesome. And um, as I said before, we will be sure to put the website uh, in the description below for people who want to look at the code and the explanation a little bit further. Um, so thank you very much.